Library. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Johnston to talk about his book, um, Murder, Inc. Um, Mr. Johnston, Jim Johnston is a writer, lecturer, and retired lawyer in Bethesda. He has more than 100 newspaper and magazine articles to his credit on topics such as law, history, art, terrorism, and books. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, White House History, Howard Law Journal, Legal Times of Washington, American Lawyer, and Maryland Historical Society Magazine. He is on the Speaker's Bureau of the Montgomery County Historical Society in the U.S. Department of State. He has written three books, Murder, Inc., the CIA under John F. Kennedy, From Slave Ship, Slave Ship to Harvard, Yarrow Mamut and the History of an African American Family, and the Recollections of Margaret Cabell Brown Loughborough, A Southern Woman's Memory of Richmond, Virginia and Washington, D.C. in the Civil War. Please, um, so a, a couple of notes. You will be unmuted. You will be muted throughout the program. You will not be able to unmute yourself. So please put any questions in the chat box and I will ask them to Mr. Johnson at the end of the program. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Denise, and, and thank everyone for coming. Um, I'm Jim Johnston, and I'm going to talk about Murder, Inc. And let me switch now for two seconds to my PowerPoint uh, presentation, and we'll go from there. The book is Murder, Inc., and the title came um, from Lyndon Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson. When he left office, uh, some reporter asked him uh, who killed, who assassinated John Kennedy. And Johnson said, uh, Fidel Castro. And that was sort of a surprise to the reporter. And he said, well, why? Uh, and Lyndon Johnson said, well, Castro retaliated. Kennedy was trying to kill him. Kennedy was running a damn murder ink in the Caribbean. So that's what my tale book is about and uh, what I'm going to talk about today. And the attempts to get rid of Castro. Kennedy wanted to get rid of Castro. So in a summary of what my talk is going to be about, there were four ways to do that. He could do an invasion, he could assassinate Castro, he could foment a revolution in Cuba, or he could have a coup. And he's, all these I'm gonna talk about today. And as we go through this chronologically, you'll see how this all developed until in the final week of Kennedy's life, uh, he was involved deeply in trying to overthrow Castro in a coup with the man leading the coup wanted to kill Kennedy. So with that, let me begin also with some questions to ask yourself, because uh, first one is, did Kennedy authorize the CIA to assassinate Fidel Castro? Second one is, did Lyndon Johnson authorize the CIA to cover up the assassination plot from the Warren Commission? And finally, are the CIA's secrecy, compartmentation, and plausible denial doctrines compatible with democracy? Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, plausible denial later. Secrecy, you know, compartmentation means even if you have a clearance to get some information, you're not going to get it unless you have a need to know that uh, secret information is compartmented like the uh, parts of a ship are comparted, compartmented so that if an iceberg hits the ship, it won't sink. The only uh, some compartments will. The same thing happens with compartmentation. As one CIA witness said, on assassination, oh, you don't put that kind of thing in writing. That's a kind of compartmentation. I learned of all this originally from a 1975-1976 investigation called by the so-called Church Committee. That's Senator Frank Church on the left, from Democrat from Idaho, the chairman and the vice chairman, Senator John Tower, Republican from Texas. And among the hearings, they, they were looking into abuses by the intelligence committees. And among the abuses they were looking into was plans to assassinate foreign leaders. And here, Frank Church is holding up a dart gun, a compressed air gun that fired a dart coated with shellfish toxin, the deadliest substance in the world. Excuse me, Mr. Johnson, we're seeing just a blank screen. We're not ah. seeing the picture that you're talking about. Ah, thank you very much, because I'm seeing it. We'll go back. Well, let me go, let me move back from share screen. And if that doesn't work, you've got the uh, video, right? 
it did come up. It, it just came up before you closed it. So let's okay, try it again. You should have Frank Church on now. Yes, sir. All right. So uh, it fired shellfish toxin, the deadliest substance in the world. And I was on a staff lawyer for this committee. And this is where I first learned about it because the question arose after they investigated all these plots to kill foreign leaders, including Fidel Castro, did Castro retaliate? And so I was on a subcommittee that looked at that and wrote a report. And uh, once all these materials were finally put into the National Archives and made public, I used them uh, to write this book. And I'll also go to some of the other sources later. Now turning to John Kennedy. This is John Kennedy, the Congressman, and I hope you have an image on, uh, John Kennedy, the Congressman from Boston in 1948. Uh, he was somewhat of a war hero, ran for Congress. And in 1948, uh, you know, the Republicans were charging Democrats with being pro-communist. And John Kennedy decided in his political career, he didn't want anybody to be able to levy that charge against him. So he would be staunchly anti-communist. And that was a policy he continued throughout his uh, political career. In 1948, uh, the China had fallen to the communist and the Republicans would say that the Truman administration lost China. And so that was the, and you know, McCarthy came along a bit later. So Kennedy was always uh, staunchly anti-communist. In 1952, he was elected to the Senate from Massachusetts. And of course, in 1960, he ran against Richard Nixon, who had been vice president under Dwight Eisenhower. He defeated Nixon and became president in January 1961. But in the interim, a very important thing happened in, as far as my tale goes. In Cuba, there was a revolution led by Fidel Castro, the man here on the left, and his other cohorts, and they overthrew the government of Batista, who was a dictator, and he fled the country in January 1959. And so when the uh, 1960 presidential election came along, there was a big issue about Cuba. And John Kennedy was able to turn the tables on Nixon since Cuba had fallen under the Eisenhower administration. John Kennedy said during the famous debates, I'm not one of the, I was not part of the administration that lost Cuba, turning it back on the Republicans. Fidel Castro himself was at this point not a communist, but others in his government were, including this man, Che Guevara. Uh, his real name was Ernesto Guevara. Che is a Latin American slang for Argentinian. And so he was Argentinian. He wasn't even Cuban but he was a very staunch communist and very much allied with the Soviet Union. Therefore, on January 20th, 1961, John Kennedy took office and in his famous inaugural address, everyone remembers that he asked, um, asked not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. But in fact, a good part of that address was directed at Cuba and at the Western Hemisphere, keeping communism out of the Western Hemisphere. And Cuba was sort of the stepping stone for communism to enter Latin America. Kennedy uh, had evolved a policy that uh, the Eisenhower administration had a policy of containment, stopping communism from spreading around the world. John Kennedy said, no, we've got to do better than that. We've got to roll it back. I want countries to fall to us, communist countries to fall to us. So, you know, Cuba was a number one priority. The other priority was Vietnam, where North Vietnam was trying to overthrow the government of South Vietnam. So John Kennedy's two major hotspots in terms of his anti-communism were Cuba and Vietnam. But even before he took office, he took office January 20, 1961. In August of 1960, the CIA had already hatched plans to assassinate Castro. And the CIA said, we don't really know how to do this, so we'll go to the people that do, the, under, uh, the underworld, the mob. And so the CIA went to Sam Giancana of Chicago and said, hey, you guys know how to kill people. Uh, what, why don't we get together and get rid of Castro? And Giancana said, well, uh, you talk to Johnny Roselli. 
And this is Johnny Roselli in the center. And he became the point man for the CIA. He was dealing directly with CIA officers uh, to kill Castro. And the third man was Santo Traficante. His father had owned casinos in Havana and Castro had shut those down with the revolution. And so Traficante was flying back and forth to Cuba trying to get the casinos open so he could take things to Cuba. And the CIA started dealing with the mob because they thought they had hitmen who would go out with machine guns and gun down Castro. But the, uh, Roselli said, we, we can't do that. Our, our guys are professional. They, they want to go home at night and, you know, so if you try to shoot Castro with a machine gun or something, uh, the, uh, the hitman would be killed. So instead they used poisons. The CIA was infatuated with poisons. And the idea with poison is you give it to the victim. He doesn't show symptoms for a while. The man who's done it can get away. And so they worked with the CIA with poisons. And in fact, Roselli would get poison materials from the CIA and give them to Traficante to get into Cuba. And it, by January of 1961, when Kennedy was taking office, they had developed one of these plans where they knew the chef at Castro's favorite restaurant, and they, he was willing to put poison in Castro's food. But Castro sort of was leery of all this stuff, and he changed restaurants. So they lost access to Castro, and the CIA, Kennedy wanted Castro out. And so the only way the CIA knew how to do that was to invade and they had a fallback plan that is known as the Bay of Pigs. About 1,300 Cuban exiles trained as a military force landed at a place in Cuba in a, aptly named the Bay of Pigs because it was a disaster. Uh, Castro captured or killed all of the men, including all 1,300 men, everybody. When these men were on the beach being, you know, seeing that they would lose, they asked the United States, since it was a CIA-backed operation, for military support, and the CIA took it up to John Kennedy, and he said, no, I, I will not put military in, into this. As a result, he, John Kennedy got a reputation among the Cuban exile community as being kind of a chicken, uh, that he would talk big, but he would chicken out at the end, and that would haunt Kennedy. The Bay of Pigs disaster, as it was called, was in April of 1961, just shortly after John Kennedy took office. And so at, as a result of that, he said, I want to shake up. I'm going to shake up the CIA. I'm going to get rid of the director. And in its place, I'm going to appoint my brother, Robert Kennedy, and I'll call him Bobby, I think, just because it's easier. Uh, but Bobby Kennedy was the attorney general. And so John Kennedy said, okay, I want Bobby to go over and become director of the CIA. And the CIA said, that's not a good idea because of this doctrine of plausible denial. The way you run secret operations is you keep them so the world can't prove that the CIA did it. That's called plausible denial. We'll have a cover story that'll be a lie. But if it's plausible, people believe it. And even if they prove that the CIA was behind something like the Bay of Pigs, will have plausible denial so that the president can say, I didn't know. If your brother is running the CIA, you can't very well say, I didn't know what the CIA was doing. So John Kennedy said, that's fine. He kept Bobby Kennedy as the attorney general, but he moved Bobby Kennedy into a position on committees where anything having to do with Cuba had to be run through Bobby Kennedy. He sat on foreign policy committees, committees making foreign policy decisions about Cuba, a very unusual thing, obviously, for an attorney general to do. The other part of the shakeup was in this man. Uh, his name is Bill Harvey. Uh, the man who was actually running Cuban operations was kicked out. Bill Harvey was put in his place. And Bill Harvey was said to be the best secret agent the CIA had, the best operative. Um, when Bobby Kennedy met him, he said, are you our James Bond? Because that was sort of Harvey's reputation. He had actually been an FBI agent and then moved over to the CIA. Bobby Kennedy said, ask, are you our James Bond? In somewhat in jest because Bill Harvey didn't look the part. 
he was overweight. Uh, he had a thyroid condition that gave him sort of bug-eyed. He was really, uh, a, you know, he carried a pistol between the cheeks of his rear end for security because he didn't think people would search there. But worst of all, he was an alcoholic. And so uh, he tended to get drunk at meetings. He didn't like the Kennedys and he would call them very, very bad names. He would argue with Bobby Kennedy at meetings, but he was running all CIA operations against Cuba and he was in direct contact with Johnny Roselli on the assassination operations. He would take, Bill Harvey would personally take the poison from CIA and Langley down to Florida and give it to Johnny Roselli to get to Cuba. So this is the kind of stuff that's going on under the Kennedy administration. And um, the net effect was not much got done. They had lots of plans, lots of schemes, but nothing really happened in terms of getting rid of Castro. And Kennedy was very frustrated with this. He was constantly, President Kennedy was constantly pressing them to get something done. And then everything changed in October, when they October 1962, when they discovered the Soviet Union had long range missiles in Cuba that strike the United States. And these missiles were capable of carrying nuclear warheads. And this was the Cuban Missile Crisis. So from the Bay of Pigs, April 1961 until October 1962, there were lots of schemes by the CIA, but nothing much happened and then Kennedy got blindsided by the so-called Cuban Missile Crisis. He and Bobby worked together and really did an incredible job. They, they brought the world to the brink of World War III by confronting the Russian ships that were taking these things into Cuba, but he, he won. You know, Khrushchev, the premier of the Soviet Union, backed down, pulled the missiles out of Cuba, and all Kennedy gave him in exchange for that was a vague promise not to invade Cuba. But Kennedy said uh, after, in a private meeting uh, after the Cuban Missile Crisis was over, he said, frankly, I have no intention of taking uh, an invasion of Cuba off the table as one of our options. So publicly, he sort of said, I won't invade Cuba. Privately, he didn't see that as a barrier to him. Of course, Bill Harvey had to go. He was lots of problems with Bobby Kennedy. He didn't like Bobby Kennedy, and that was tough since Kennedy was, Bobby Kennedy was running things. In his place, they appointed this man. His name is Desmond Fitzgerald. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Desmond Fitzgerald, both Irish names, but uh, John Kennedy was Catholic, Boston Catholic, uh, Irish, Desmond Fitzgerald was Yankee Protestant Irish, and so they didn't have that kind of thing in common. They weren't relatives, but the one thing they did have in common was Jack Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, and Desmond Fitzgerald all went to Harvard, so they were Harvard men, whereas Bill Harvey had gone to the University of Indiana, so you know, this was a real you know, big difference in the way the Kennedys looked now at the CIA. This man I'm gonna talk about later, this is Richard Helms. He was, at the time this all was going on, the number two man at the CIA. The director was a businessman. Uh, Richard Helms was the number two man. He was the professional spy. So in terms of who was running the spy operations, it was Richard Helms. When Kennedy, after they got Desmond Fitzgerald in, and this is in the spring of 1963, the last year of Kennedy's administration, Kennedy told Fitzgerald, he said, look, I want to get rid of Castro and you, now that you've got this new look on things, you do it any way uh, you can possibly can and assume that you have unlimited resources in terms of manpower and money. And this was something, you know, the CIA agents, uh, officer's dream was to have that kind of thing from the president. So Fitzgerald went away and came back in a few months or weeks and he said okay mr president i've got it here what we're going to do is you know you've been trying to uh, get rid of castro individually but that doesn't work because uh, if he goes we get somebody worse like maybe che guevara would become president of cuba uh, and this invasion at the bay of pigs was stupid what we want to do 
is we need to have a coup in Cuba. We, the CIA, we do coups all the time. We know how to do a coup. And so let's have a coup in Cuba. I'll organize one for you. They work. We have, you know, sort of a standard book on how you run a coup. You get the military involved, you blow up the radio station, or you take control of the radio station. You have the military involved because that gives you, you know, force power. And that's the way you do it. So Kennedy said, okay, uh, that sounds like a good idea. And the, the CIA began working on that. But the key to a coup is to get someone who will lead it, some spark who will light the fire. And they searched around. And in the summer of 1963, they found that man that they thought. His name is Rolando Cubella. He was a hero of the Cuban Revolution. He was a personal friend of Fidel Castro's. He was an anti-communist. He hated Che Guevara, you know, Argentinian, mucking around in Cuban affairs. Uh, he was a medical doctor. He had the ability, he had enough confidence, Castro had enough confidence in him. He could fly around the world where the CIA could meet him wherever they wanted to. And perhaps oh, the CIA did not overlook the fact that this pistol on his belt, he had assassinated uh, a Batista police officer during the Cuban Revolution. So he, they knew that he could also be a trigger man. So on September, they had met with Kubela in the summer of 1962, and he agreed to spy for them, but nothing really came of that because he was mercurial. But they said, okay, in 1963, we would like to meet with you on September 9th, 1963 in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Uh, Kubela would be there for an athletic competition. He was gonna, you know, sort of be Castro's personal representative to these games. And that would give the CIA an opportunity to meet with them. And this is one of the key, this is the beginning of the final plot against Castro, the plot that would uh, come to the end when Kennedy was assassinated. So on September 9th, 1963, two months before the assassination, the CIA goes to Brazil, meets with them, and they say, hey, what do you think? And he says, oh, we gotta get rid of Castro. I, I wanna overthrow him. And they said, would you lead a coup? He said, well, I'm, I might. He said, but you know, we got to kill Castro. You, you can't let Castro live. And the CIA was a little queasy about that. And they, so they, they temporized. And nothing was done except this first general meeting on September 9th in Brazil. That same night, September 9th in Cuba, in Havana, Fidel Castro went to the Brazilian embassy for a party, pulled aside an American reporter, and this was the story. Said tonight, United States leaders would be in danger. And here's what Castro's words, the last sentence. United States leaders should be mindful that if they are aiding terrorist plans to eliminate Cuban leaders, they themselves will not be safe. Well, that's exactly what they were doing with meeting with Cubella. He was a terrorist, planned to eliminate Cuban leaders. And so Kennedy, uh, Castro says, if you keep doing that, I'll kill Kennedy. That's, you know, pretty obvious warning or threat. The CIA never analyzed this, but there was an interagency group in charge of Cuba, and they did. They had never seen Castro say something this violent. And they said, okay, what's, he, what's, what's the threat here? So, okay, and they came up with several things he might do. Uh, the Cubans might blow up an oil refinery in Latin America. They might assassinate an American businessman in Latin America. They might assassinate an American diplomat in Latin America. They never considered what Castro had threatened, which was to kill Kennedy. And therefore, they never told the Secret Service, nor did they tell the FBI that they thought Castro had made a credible threat with these words. After September 9th, Kubella goes on to Europe. The CIA continues to meet with him, and uh, they continue this dialogue about overthrowing Castro. And finally, Kubella says, okay, we've been meeting about this, but you guys are low-level diplomat, uh, low-level bureaucrats. I don't know if I'm dealing with the big people who call the shots. Kennedy chickened out in the Bay of Pigs. He's got a terrible reputation in Cuba. If I'm trying to organize a coup and getting people to work with me, 
how am I going to explain that Kennedy is behind this? How can I prove to them that Kennedy is behind this? How do I know that Kennedy is behind this? How do I know he won't chicken out? When that message got back to the CIA, it got back on October 10th, 1963, in early afternoon, around noon on uh, October 10th. In my research, I had someone look at the Kennedy Library for Bobby Kennedy's phone call records and here is a phone call record on 10, October 10th, 1963, at 2.30 in the afternoon, Desmond Fitzgerald called Bobby Kennedy and let, wanted him to call back. So within two hours of getting word that Kubella wanted, you know, some higher authority to, behind him, uh, Fitzgerald calls Bobby Kennedy. And, and in fact, uh, Kubella said, I want to talk to Bobby Kennedy because I know he runs things for the CIA. There is no record that Bobby Kennedy knew or approved of what was going on. However, and, and again, this is sort of this plausible denial, you know, you don't talk of, you don't put these things into writing. However, uh, after this, there is uh, CI records, memorandum saying that the plan was to send a military aircraft to France to pick Kubella up, fly him to Washington, D.C., for a meeting personally with Bobby Kennedy. So presumably that's what all of this phone call record was the start of. Again, things continue through the fall of 1963. Uh, this is October 10th. By October, late October, they're able to convince Kubella that he doesn't really need to meet with Bobby Kennedy that if he could meet with Bobby Kennedy's personal representative and they, they could actually send that representative to Europe, it'd be a lot easier. So Kubella agrees to that. And on October 29th, 1963, Desmond Fitzgerald flies to Paris and meets Kubella there. Fitzgerald is under an assumed name, but he represents himself as being Bobby Kennedy's personal representative, which he is. And uh, a personal friend of Bobby Kennedy's, which he is. And Kubella accepts that. And he says, okay, I'm satisfied with all these, you know, cosmic things. I'm satisfied that the Kennedy administration is behind this. I'm satisfied you'll give me support. But I still need, and he had been talking all fall about this, I need weapons. I need rifles with telescopic sights. That's what you use to assassinate people and I want some kind of poison device to protect myself. And with that, on October 29th, uh, Fitzgerald leaves Paris with nothing decided about giving Kubella assassination weapons. That's October 29th. On November 1st, as the Washington Post says, in that other hotspot of Vietnam, there's been a coup. And the president of Vietnam, who uh, is not, uh, Kennedy does not like, uh, has been captured in a coup and assassinated. And they do it just like the CIA book was. You bring the tanks into Saigon. And this was, you know, the plan for Cuba. And while later investigations found that the CIA wasn't actually behind this, this is a Newsweek article from 19, or from 2013, just uh, eight years ago, saying the CIA did it. So if you're, in, if you're a Fidel Castro and you know about Cubella, this was the meeting in Paris on Tuesday. Diem is assassinated on Friday, November 1st, and Kennedy is going to be assassinated on the 22nd. Now, now I'm going to this, this last week, and this is sort of the big time of what's going on. And bear in mind, when the Warren Commission investigated the Kennedy assassination, they knew none of what you're about to hear. On uh, Monday, November 18th, John Kennedy went to Tampa, Florida, and uh, this is also by the same photographer that took the cover of my book. It's a former FBI agent, Moses Alleman, who passed away of COVID recently. And he was guarding Kennedy and also taking pictures. And here's Kennedy going through uh, a baseball stadium at Tampa on the Monday afternoon, November 18th. This is the same car in which he would be assassinated in Dallas. You can see how dangerous it is. You can see there's no protection except for a couple of Secret Service agents around him. 
that night, Kennedy went down to Miami, flew down to Miami from Tampa, and gave a speech to the Latin American Press Association. And this was, idea was, this speech would be disseminated all over Latin America. And the key part was written by the CIA. And here is what Kennedy said. It is important to restate what now divides Cuba from my country. It is the fact that there's a small band of conspirators, meaning the Castro regime. And then down later, he says, this and this alone divides us. As long as this is true, nothing is possible. Without it, everything is possible. And then the key words, once this barrier is removed, the barrier being Castro, we'll be ready and anxious to work with the Cuban people. The CIA wrote this intending to signal to Cubella that John Kennedy himself was behind this. You know, they might not be able to get Cubella to meet with John Kennedy, but they could have Kennedy make a public statement that was targeted specifically at Cubella and those who would overthrow Castro. The next day, Cubella says, I'm going to go back to Cuba. I got to go back to Cuba. He's in Paris. And they say, well, look, if you go back to Cuba, we can't talk to him. What are we going to do? And so once the CIA hears, learns that Cubella is going to go back to Cuba, on Tuesday, November 19th, Richard Helms, deputy director of the CIA, calls up Bobby Kennedy and says, I got to talk to you. Now, Kennedy says, I mean, uh, Helms says this had to do with an arms cache they found in Venezuela that the Kennedys were interested in. And that's <clears throat> the only record of what was actually said. And again, we're talking about plausible denial. So uh, Helms goes over to Bobby Kennedy's office at the Justice Department, talks to him. Bobby Kennedy says, you need to talk to the president. Again, Hel Helms's version is the only version we got. You need to talk to the president. Take you know this weapon with you to the. It's a machine gun he's brought. Go talk to the president. So White House logs, November nineteenth, Tuesday, six fifteen. Mr. Richard Helms and Herschel Peake, another CIA officer, go see Kennedy. We don't know. There we only have Helms's version of what they talked about. It's pretty innocuous. They joked. For some reason, John Kennedy wants to see this machine gun that they found in Venezuela. That's what Helms's version is. But that same day, CIA records show this. This is by the case officer who's running Kubella. Desmond Fitzgerald approved telling Kubella that we would give him uh, assass I don't mean assassination weapons, rifles with telescopic sights and the other material he had been requested. And then the last line is you can read, Desmond Fitzgerald requested written reports kept to a minimum. Again, plausible denial. <clears throat> but that's not the end of Tuesday night, the 19th. Later that night, there's been a man in Washington, this man, Jean Daniel, a reporter for uh, the New Republic, a French uh, man who's working for the New Republic. And he's got this scheme to be a go-between, between, personal go-between between John Kennedy and Fidel Castro. He's going to interview John Kennedy, and he did that in October to see how he feels about Cuba. And then he'll go down and talk to Castro and, of course, write an article about it, but more importantly, be able, allowing the two men to communicate directly through him. And so he's been in Havana for a couple of days, and Castro won't see him. And suddenly, Tuesday night at 10 o'clock, Castro says, come on over. And they talk from 10 at night until 4 a.m. the next morning. According to Daniels, uh, Castro's railing against Kennedy, terrible guy, but at the end says, well, maybe I can work with him. And so this is Tuesday night. All this stuff has happened on this one day, big pot boiling with Cuba. The next day, Wednesday, uh, I finally bring Lee Harvey Oswald and I believe Oswald killed Kennedy with that rifle and that he was the lone assassin. Uh, Oswald is waiting. He's been working at the book depository in Dallas. His wife is living in the suburbs. And uh, so on Wednesday, it's just a normal day for him. He's, in theory, he's living apart from her. But on this Wednesday, November 20th, 
Uh, the CIA now has authority to tell Kubella they'll give him assassination weapons. And so they call Kubella, Kubella in Paris and say, we would like to meet with you before you go back to Havana. <clears throat> Kubella says, is it going to be an interesting meeting? There's someone in the room with him. He can't talk freely. And the CIA officer says, I don't know if it's interesting. It's the meeting you wanted, the meeting you requested. And the CIA said in testimony that Kubella would have understood that to mean they were going to give him assassination weapons. This relates to Oswald because that same day, Oswald is in his rooming house in Dallas. He doesn't have the rifle. It's out in the suburbs where his wife lives. So the next morning, the first thing he does when he gets to work is ask a coworker if he can have a ride out to his wife's house. He agrees. Oswald, in fact, went out to the suburbs, spent the night with his wife, picked up the rifle at that house, and took it back with him to the school book depository on the morning of November 22nd and assassinated John Kennedy with three shots. <clears throat> Oswald was picked up a few hours later. This is his mugshot, bruise on his head. He had a fight with police. But also on Friday, the day of the assassination, in Paris, uh, the CIA is meeting with Kubella showing him, promising him rifles with telescopic sights, showing him the speech that they wrote for Fitz, uh, Desmond Fitz, uh, for John Kennedy on Monday, saying, we wrote that, Kennedy supports you, and, promise, and showing him a poison device he could use to protect himself. The meeting breaks up upon word that Kennedy has been assassinated <clears throat> in Dallas. <clears throat> Excuse me, at the moment Kennedy is assassinated, though, in Havana, Castro has arranged for John Daniels, the reporter, to come over for lunch. So Castro is actually having lunch with an American reporter when Kennedy is assassinated. He's very open about this. At the end of all the, as they listen to the news and J Daniels starts to leave, he says, Castro's last question <clears throat> was about Lyndon Johnson taking over. And Castro asked, what authority does Johnson exercise over the CIA? So here's that last week. Say, I wrote this speech on Sunday, November 17th. On Monday, <coughs> Kennedy went to Florida, gave that barrier speech. Tuesday, they learned that uh, Cabell is going back to Cuba. Helms goes to see the Justice Department. <coughs> and then Kennedy, CIA memo says that's when they got authority to give uh, Kubella assassination weapons. Castro did that interview with John Daniels that night. On Wednesday, Kubella says he's, uh, they call Kubella say, we want to meet with you on Friday. Oswald had to make the decision that night to kill Kennedy because he doesn't have his rifle. He doesn't take an overt act to kill Kennedy until the next day morning when he goes to work. <clears throat> on Friday, there's the assassination, the CIA meeting with Kubella and the Castro interview with Sean Daniel. There's only one man, Lyndon, uh, Lyndon Johnson, new president, appoints the Warren Commission to investigate. There's only one man <clears throat> in the United States government who knows everything, who knows about the CIA operations against Castro, and who knows everything that's being turned up in the Oswald, about Oswald in the assassination investigation and that's Richard Helms. And he, the Warren Commission never knew, never learned any of the things that happened in this last week that you have just heard. On December 19th, 1963, less than a month after the assassination, Lyndon Johnson meets with, here's Richard Helms and Desmond Fitzgerald <clears throat> in the White House. And Lyndon Johnson, obviously not too pleased, says to Desmond Fitzgerald, Someday we're going to have to answer for what we've been doing in the Caribbean. So it's clear that Johnson has been told something about what's going on. And all of the, the Cabela operation is shut down. And in fact, by the next summer, all operations against Cuba are stopped. Lyndon Johnson wants to focus on the war in Vietnam. Things the Warren Commission wasn't told. There's this man, Gilberto Lopez, 
uh, the Mexican police, he crossed the border from Texas into Mexico the night of the assassination, went to Mexico City, was the only passenger on a Cabana airline flights to Havana. The Mexican, and look, this is taken at the airport. <clears throat> he's wearing sunglasses. Seven o'clock at night, he's wearing sunglasses to avoid identification. Mexican police say he was involved in the assassination. The CIA never told the Warren Commission about this. Uh, and they never asked the Mexican police what material they had on it. This is the kind of horrible mistakes that were made. In 1967, Johnny Roselli went to uh, his attorney, his lawyer, eventually worked his way up to Earl Warren and said, hey, my client <clears throat> was participating in plans to assassinate Fidel Castro. My client says Castro retaliated and killed Kennedy. Nothing is done. Linda, it gets to Lyndon Johnson. He orders the CIA to make a report. They make a report, and then nothing happens with that report. It wasn't until the Senate Intelligence Committee in 1975, 76, uh, and the other investigations, I'll talk about in a minute, that any of this material was ever learned. Johnny Roselli, Sam Giancana, was supposed to testify before the Senate Intelligence Committee. He was murdered uh, after he was under subpoena. Johnny Roselli did testify. He was murdered a few months later. Uh, his body was found floating in a 55 gallon drum uh, in, uh, off the Florida coast. So what I've uh, finally wrap up here with, I went too fast with my, finally wrap up. The Warren Commission wanted to paint, and this is something I deal with in my book. They wanted to paint Oswald as a nut that, you know, he just killed Kennedy on his own. And they said he was, and here's from the Warren Commission, he was motivated by hostility to environment, <clears throat> couldn't establish meaningful relationships with people, disconnected with the world around him, discontented, and that he wanted the role of being a great man who would be recognized as having been in advance of his times, you know. He had an inferiority complex and he wanted to compensate. So when I was on the Senate Intelligence Committee, I asked an intelligence officer as a witness, you know, uh, Oswald was not the kind of man that the intelligence service would use to commit an assassination. And the intelligence officer said, oh no, Mr. Johnston, he was exactly the kind of man they would have used. And he pointed out that the Soviet Union developed assassinations in, night, in World War II to assassinate German, German officers. And this was, that was led by a man named General Suda Platov. And here is what he said as to what kind of people you want as an assassin. People who are hurt by fate or nature, ugly, those suffering from an inferiority complex, craving power and influence. The sense of belonging to an influential and powerful organization will give them a feeling of superiority over the handsome and prosperous people around them. For the first times in their lives, they will experience a sense of importance. It is sad indeed and humanly shallow, but we are obliged to profit from it. In other words, Lee Harvey, the Warren Commission in describing Oswald and trying to say he wouldn't have done it, uh, that he was not part of a conspiracy, described the person that precise personality that the Soviet Union used for assassins and they trained Cuba. What I've gone through with the afterwards, the Warren Commission was in 1964. They didn't know about all of this. The Rockefeller Commission learned about it in 1975. The Church Committee learned about it in 1975, 76. And then the House Committee looked into it in 1978. All of these people, all of these committees have investigated the assassination. And so when they talk about the secret files and the files that I used in writing the book, they came from all of these investigations. And of course, finally, I came from Richard Helms's book, A Look Over My Shoulder, but this was published in 2004 after all those investigations were over and was published posthumously. Helms had died before this book was made public. So that's the story. You can go back and ask yourselves the question, you know, uh, did John Kennedy authorize the assassination? There's no direct evidence. Did Lyndon Johnson authorize the cover, cover up? There's no direct evidence. But of course, you're dealing with agencies that have doctrines of plausible denial, compartmentation, 
and secrecy. Thank you very much. And I'll go back to um, full screen with me and take questions. There aren't any right yet, so let's oh, well, give people okay. a chance to, to type, if there are any. They may not have any, but I can take up another five minutes in talking if there are no questions. <laughs> All the things that I cut out. The, the, uh, I, I think that the main point I'm, I, I, I'm the book is a straight history. It is, I, I intended it not as a conspiracy theory, not as a theory about who killed John Kennedy, but rather as a history of what happened so that people could know and judge for themselves as to whether what happened, number one, but more, more significantly as a warning about secrecy and secret agencies. Um, I say in the book that the CIA uh, thought of itself at the time function as kind of a Praetorian guard, as in ancient Rome. Uh, the Praetorian guard was loyal to Caesar. It wasn't loyal to the Republic or to the people. And under prior CIAs, uh, did, well, that appeared to be the case, that the CIA considered itself as John Kennedy's personal agency. And therefore, when he died, my view is they were interested in protecting his memory. They needed authority from Lyndon Johnson to do it. They probably wouldn't have covered things up without authority from the president. But when they appeared before the Senate Intelligence Committee, for example, Johnson was long gone. Uh, Gerald Ford was president. Richard Nixon had been president. So lots of presidents had passed by. And so why didn't the CIA, in my view, I never understood why they didn't come before the Senate Intelligence Committee and be forthright. Why didn't Richard Helms, there were four investigations and none of those investigations did Richard Helms ever say that he had met with John Kennedy on November 19th, three days before Kennedy was assassinated and give people the opportunity to ask him, what did you talk about? In my research, I knew that Kennedy had uh, oral tapes of his office. He taped lots of meetings. Uh, there is no, there are no tapes, any tapes whatsoever of Kennedy's conversations after the 1st of November. After uh, he did tape the meetings on Vietnam, but there are no other tapes available. Doesn't mean that work made. Uh, they were turned over to Bobby Kennedy on the day of the assassination. If there are no other questions, I'll let you all uh, go for the afternoon. And I've enjoyed it. I hope you have. Um, I hope people can chat. Oh, so there isn't been anything coming in. Let me ask everybody to unmute and see if they have any questions. Okay. So I just invited them to unmute. <laughs> So if anybody has any questions, go ahead and ask them. I have a question, Mr. Johnson. Um, I, I guess I'm a little bit confused because I had always been under the impression that the CIA might have been actually uh, against the president rather than protecting the president. And then, in fact, that they may have um, not not assassinated themselves, but that they uh, had turned a blind eye to uh, intelligence that they were aware of. Yes, that's that's a very common theory, and it's been put out a lot. You know. Uh, Oliver Stone's movie, JFK, sort of went down that line. Um, I, I think that's just factually terribly inaccurate. In fact, okay. flat wrong. You know, Bobby Kennedy was running the CIA, in effect. You know, he, there was nothing that went on there that he didn't know about. At one point, I say in the book, at one point, 
it appears he knew more about what was going on in the CIA than the director of the CIA did. Uh, you know, he would have CIA officers over to his house. He met personally with the guy meeting with Kubella. He was a personal friend of Desmond Fitzgerald. If anything like that had been gone, going on at the CIA, all of these people were John Kennedy fans. It would have been literally impossible. I um, majored in forensic science in grad school and my professor, Dr. Dave Crown, um, was on the Warren Commission apparently and was an advisor. Um, he had a PhD from criminal, in criminalistics from um, uh, Berkeley um, under the famous, um, um, I'm trying to think of Kent's first name. Um, it, there, I, there was a famous, uh, Kirk, Kirk, Dr. Paul Kirk. Um, but anyway, anyway, just to give you some background here, my, my professor, Dr. Crown, was um, always um, talking about how it was just Oswald and the, um, the pristine bullets and all of this was, was completely believable. But, you know, years later, I, I got the feeling that he was um, maintaining whatever the company line was. And I think that he went to his grave without revealing perhaps everything they were aware of. Well, when I was on the Senate Intelligence Committee, I had access to all the Warren Commission secret files that you know people want to have access to. Okay. I looked at the forensic, I didn't, I, I'm not real excited about forensics. <laughs> Uh, but I looked at that, and I look, and in writing the book, obviously I looked at all this uh, forensic material. I think it's unquestionable that Oswald fired shots; that it was his third shot that killed Kennedy. No one else was firing a shot. There's no question that the shot Oswald fired was the one that killed the president. No one else was firing. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of people in Dealey Plaza that day including many professional Secret Service agents and police officers. Almost all of them said the shots came from the sixth floor of the book depository. There were people that said they saw a gun pointing out that window. So, I mean, I, I, I think that this mystique has gotten built up around the Kennedy assassination. It's like current conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. If you lie, and if you lie long enough, people start believing it. And uh, in fact, if you want to muddy the waters, you know, they're part of the reason uh, some people like part of the CIA thought probably there, a lot of the CIA officers I talked to thought that probably there was a foreign conspiracy. And their view was that these conspiracy theories were all generated to just take public attention away from Lee Harvey Oswald because that was the real assassin. And if you went back through Lee Harvey Os Oswald, you could trace it back to some foreign agency. So, I mean, that's their theory, and I, 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 it seemed pretty plausible to me. Well, thank, thank you. Thanks for okay. answering my questions. Okay. There is a question in the chat room. Was Jack Ruby a part of any of the plan? Okay, that's very good. Um, I don't deal, I do deal with Jack Ruby for a couple of reasons. Um, he, again, it was the Warren Commission's strangeness. Any time, uh, any evidence that took away from their story, they didn't highlight and didn't make public. For example, I didn't know until very late uh, in my research that Jack Ruby was uh, I think the Warren Commission said he was trying to take an ad out in the newspaper, the Dallas Morning News. What the Warren Commission didn't say was the newspaper's office was on Dealey Plaza. So the, Jack Ruby was in an office that could have looked out on Dealey Plaza when Kennedy gets assassinated. I'll get to the point of that in a bit. 
the Warren Commission and a lot of people say he couldn't have committed it. He couldn't have uh, been part of a conspiracy. He couldn't have planned to assassinate Oswald because when he shot Oswald, he was just happened to be there that day on Sunday morning, got out of his car, walked by the police station, happened to have a gun in his pocket and shot Oswald. What they don't point out was that there were multiple witnesses that said Jack Ruby was at the police station where Oswald was Friday night, right after the assassination. That, <clears throat> in fact, he tried to get into the room where they were questioning Oswald and that Ruby himself admitted that he had a gun that night. So, you know, it seems to me pretty clear that Jack Ruby was from moment one planning to kill Oswald. Um, how that would, whether that would be part of a conspiracy, who knows? Uh, my view is that uh, the Cubans had no direct contact with Oswald, but when I was looking at how assassinations are done, one of the things you don't do is if you're going to, if A, if man A assassinates a person, then, and somebody, you want to rub out man A, then you have man B assassinate man A, but there's not, not going to be any connection between A and B. Those, so that if you break the, you can't trace things back to those two men. They would never be in contact. They would never know each other. They would be run through separate networks. That's the way it's done. So it doesn't, I don't think Jack Ruby really helps us know who was behind Oswald, if anyone. Thank if you. There, if there are no more questions. I don't see any other questions. Thank right. you very much for doing this today, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank everyone for coming. I'm, oh, I got to thank you. Okay. And, <laughs> we all leave the meeting, right? Yep. I'm, yep. Thank you very much, everybody. See you next time. Okay. Bye. <laughs>